All right, y'all, in-depth analysis time. This is the moment we've all been waiting for, and I appreciate your patience. Now, what you may notice based off the length of the video, I still think it's going to be a pretty long one. I have yet to edit it, but I know it's going to probably end up being shorter than the Starfield Developer Direct. Why is that? Normally, when Maddie sits down with a two-minute trailer, it ends up being a 20-plus minute video. Well... Bethesda kind of did my job for me. I don't know if I should take that personally, but they did an in-depth analysis during this deep dive. A lot of the stuff that I could pick out, they highlighted themselves or talked about in some way, shape, or form. So for me, I really had to get my in-depth analysis energy on and go deeper. And so with that, it's going to be a different format this time around. It's going to still go in the same start-to-finish sequence that we always do. We're not going to hop out of order with what's shown off in the Starfield Direct. But what I'm doing is more so a highlight reel of cool things I discovered, smaller details I discovered that I feel aren't immediately apparent to the viewer that you have to stop, take a moment and look at as per usual in our in-depth analysis. But that's it for me. Just a quick opening message to know what to expect because it's not going to be a frame by frame breakdown. Just out of respect for your time, you know, I've seen multi-hour breakdowns, which I appreciate, but so much of it was made obvious by Bethesda Game Studios. I wanted to focus on the less obvious stuff. So that's my approach to this one. And with that, Let's roll the breakdown. First thing I want to take a look at is actually the UI. When you check out the bottom left corner, this is going to help us identify a lot of planets that we're going to be curious about throughout this deep dive. In fact, some in our very own solar system, which is quite exciting. But it's also used to indicate status effects like this here, which says there may be some type of radiation. What I also noticed is as Todd panned through these various shots of these planets, that the circle in the middle of this UI would fill gradually. You'll also even notice as you approach the abandoned mine that this serves as our replacement for the minimap bar we typically see in Bethesda Game Studios games, whether it was Skyrim or Fallout 4, Fallout 76, even you have the map bar usually at the top where all of the game's locations are set. Meanwhile, if you look here in the bottom left, you'll see as we find the abandoned mine, there is a icon for that. So this is going to serve as our map, our planetary information, and much more. At this point in the direct, we start to get a feel for the menus within Starfield. And you'll see details here that are pretty generalized, like your ship having the most interesting details, I think, about how many light years you've traveled, the size of your crew, what class your ship is, the status of your hull currently. However, what stood out to me most was you'll notice each of these sections of this little circle have notches on them that represent your ship, your missions, your inventory. However, the top middle in this screenshot does not have a notch, except deeper on in the Starfield Direct, there is a top middle notch that you can pick up on. And I found this mighty interesting because I believe based off the final shot in the Direct before it starts to wrap up where you see what we're right now in the community calling space magic, the force. I believe this is going to be our, we'll say, dragonborn ability type menu that we'll be able to assign to our character and navigate at a deeper point in the story. But still, it's something I wanted to point out that this menu will evolve and that there is a mysterious additional notch that is missing early on in this gameplay. As Todd is flipping through the menus and showing us our weapons and our spacesuits, we've gone over weapons in the past and what they've generally offered you. You can see the modifications that you can attach to them, but really what stood out to me was the spacesuits and the various characteristics attached to those, from the various defenses that they provide from physical to energy, as well as thermal, airborne, corrosive, radiation. There's a lot of status effects, and these are important to note because it ties back to what I showed you earlier with the UI on the bottom left corner and these various status effects that, that can be applied to you. Now, what's also interesting is that on the bottom of this menu, you can see that you can actually hide your spacesuit in settlement. So if you don't like the look or appearance of it, you think it looks weird, whatever it may be, you don't have to look at it if you're roaming around in third person and want to wear something else. This was a great little detail I picked up on that I think will be appreciated as we stop on certain planets and come back to them is that when you go to enter your ship, you can either board the ship, which we already see you are able to fully explore, or if you want to go straight to your cockpit, where I imagine you can start picking the next planet you want to go to, you can also travel to that right away here from this little press of a button. While Bethesda is running us through the various systems and planets that you can go through, they highlight things like the type of planet that you're going to, the temperature, and all the various status effects that can occur here. 
as well as the resources you can mine. But what stood out to me as an unaddressed detail, because that's kind of the thing we're trying to navigate here, is there's so many details Bethesda did address. What was skimmed over is that you'll notice that there are levels assigned to systems. So for particular here in the Porima system, it says it's level 30. And so I was thinking back to one of the shots we had of the menu where the mission is to go further into the unknown. And I imagine this very well, maybe a lot like No Man's Sky, where you go deeper and deeper into the galaxy to answer the question that Starfield's asking, what is actually out there? And the way they sort of gate that content so you don't go too far is the light years and the amount of travel you can do with the fuel in your spaceship, but also I think level gating some of the systems. This doesn't mean to me that you have to be a certain level to access the system, but that you'll fight enemies of this level on this system. Bethesda does give us a very detailed look at how combat works within a spaceship, but we never go over the controls, which you can see right here, where it's the right trigger to use your lasers, it's the Y button to use your missiles, you press the left stick to boost, and then you use your left stick to move around, of course, as we'd expect, and then the left trigger looks like ballistics to me. One thing I wanted to shout out was Starfield's focus on world building. I really appreciate it because here at this point, a robot walks by and says this is a colony war memorial. So you may be wondering, what is the Colony War? And it's defined as a conflict that took place in 2310 between the United Colonies and the Free Star Collective. Now, the United Colonies, you can see, are well represented here with the flags in the background. Meanwhile, the Free Star Collective are the faction that we see more in that Wild West theme, like Aquila City. That's where we see a lot of the Free Star Collective located. But here on New Atlantis, there is a memorial dedicated to this war. It's here that we get a look at one of multiple brand new factions. This one is known as the Vanguard. They're located on New Atlantis and they're a part of the United Colonies. Actually, Emil Pagliarulo defines the people living on New Atlantis as people who believe they are the true children of Earth. So it seems like there is some type of social dispute between that among, I would imagine, various factions in the game. But someone's actually requesting that you join the Vanguard and we can get a look at the type of people they are. They have their own salute. We see that they're kind of security here on the United Colonies. So it looks like Starfield's opening up the amount of factions you can actually join, which is very exciting. Afterwards, we're on Mars in a settlement known as Sidonia, and I feel like this is a place that is set to go south soon. The reason I say that is because Emil defines this as a place where the United Colonies does a lot of mining, and before they close out that shot and move on to the next part of the direct, it says they've gone 11 hours without an incident. Now, maybe it's just a tacky way to say, oh, there's always problems here, it's very corporate, who gives a dang, stay vigilant, stay alive, as it says. But still, I wanted to point it out that potentially this could be the home to a very interesting quest line. Now we're getting a deeper look at one of the nicer shots I feel in all of the Starfield Direct. It's here we're in Aquila City, which is one of the major capitals of the Free Star Collective. And there's a little signpost to the left, which says that behind us, where we're coming from, is the spaceport. So this is likely what we enter into. And then ahead of us is the COE Plaza. There's Midtown and the core. And I imagine the core is likely the front and center building right before us. But just a good way to get a feel for this location some more, because this was an attractive place a year ago before it got the major visual glow up. This I find very significant for those who have paid close attention to the lore of Starfield leading into the full Starfield Direct because when we first saw Neon, we heard that they distributed a drug called Aurora, which was one defined by Emil Pagliarulo as a drug with psychotropic attributes. And it's here that we actually see a bunch of people in hazmat suits with, to the right of the character here in the front and center, Aurora cases. So this is our first look at what this may be like and what they go through to produce such a drug. For old BGS fans, this is a nice quality of life update. You'll see on the top before combat actually begins that the caution meter is gradually filling. Now, typically what would happen in any Bethesda Game Studios game is it would just be color coordinated. But now, as you get closer and closer to alerting the enemy, that bar will fill orange when, of course, they'll be alerted and combat will ensue. So this is actually great because it's going to make stealth gameplay all the more enjoyable, which does get a focus here, and we'll talk about that later. But I really do appreciate this as someone who never found stealth in BGS games outside of the Skyrim Archer to be that appealing, and I think this is a major quality life update that needs some love. 
At this point, they're showing some off-screen gameplay of them navigating a solar system. Uh, what I thought was really cool here is you can see the faction that this system is owned by is the United Colonies. And what's cool is beneath it is that there's a bounty. It's a multi-hundred credit bounty on your head. And I like that because one thing we see later on in the direct is that there are actually bounty hunters that'll come after you trying to claim that on your head. And it reminds me a bit of some of the mercenaries you'd encounter in Fallout 3. But obviously here on a galactic level, it kind of channels that Star Wars vibe. So this was one I was tremendously excited about because it feeds some of that role playing that we're looking for in Starfield. You know, the ability to truly be a space pirate, commit crimes, and then kind of have this name in a particular system, but maybe be clear somewhere else. One thing some people were concerned about was did Bethesda Game Studios spoil the introductory moment here for Starfield by showing us the lead into the character creator? I actually don't think they did. And the reason for that is this character on the right who is holding those very artifacts that we see throughout all of Starfield's trailers because this is what the story is primarily based around. I imagine that the intro sequence does conclude with us finding these artifacts. We get knocked out, these people recover us, and that's where the character creator truly begins. This is one of the newest traits that we have seen for Starfield, and it's called Neon Street Rat. It's defined as you grow up on the mean streets of Neon, you gain access to special dialogue options and better rewards for some missions on Neon. Crime bounty by other factions is greatly increased, and you cannot combine this with other faction allegiance traits. I thought this one was really interesting because of the special dialogue options it offers, which then the direct does show off. So there's a lot of this stuff here from religious ones to even plan planet-based ones. They even have introvert, which is defined as you really need your alone time. Exerting yourself uses less oxygen when adventuring alone, but more when adventuring with other human companions. So it is a trait that's defined for the solo role player who doesn't want to pick up any companions, maybe in their starter playthrough or their follow-up playthrough. It's all this stuff that feeds the headcanon, right? These traits also impact dialogue options, as I imagine we all expected, but I was pleasantly surprised to actually see it available within the persuasion system, Starfield's brand new persuasion system, which Bethesda didn't really go into at all, by the way. So we're still kind of trying to feel out how exactly it's going to work compared to something like Oblivion. But point being here, we can see that the Cyber Runner trait is allowed to be used during the persuasion minigame here. All right, our favorite part, it's where we break down all of the skills. We're right now in the tech tree and they hover over robotics first and foremost, which is described as in an age where robots and autonomous turrets are employed in a combat capacity, the study of robotics can be instrumental in gaining a tactical edge. You may notice that there's not really a deep detailed description on any of these until you click on them. So some of them are up into interpretation like that. Meanwhile, payloads, it says any pilot can haul cargo, but it takes special determination and training to maximize cargo space, which we did see during some of the fast travel segments in outer space. There is a limit to that. So this allows you to likely carry more cargo on your ship. And then there's security, which says while the standardized digital locking mechanism is renowned for its security, any code can be broken with proper training to which when they open it, you'll see that there are four ranks available as there are for all of these skills we're looking at. We're ranked one is being able to hack advanced locks and have two auto attempts. Rank two is expert locks with three auto attempts and rings now turn blue when the pick can be slotted. Then rank three, you can attempt to hack master locks and four auto attempts can be banked. And on the fourth rank, it says expend a digi pick to eliminate keys that aren't required to solve the puzzle with five auto attempts able to be banked. So you'll notice that it really does evolve in meaningful ways, which is exciting. Afterwards, Bethesda gives us an onslaught of all these skills, some much more hidden than others. First, we get a pretty clear look at intimidation. It says the ability to strike fear into an opponent, causing them to flee so that you can escape or attack first can prove critical in battle with rank one saying you could force a target NPC at or below your level to flee for a limited time. Then rank two is you could force a target NPC up to 10 levels higher than you to flee. And then rank three is 20 levels higher. And then rank four is in Intimidated targets now flee for a substantial amount of time. Afterwards, they begin scrolling through all of these very fun looking skills. 
One's called decontamination, where the challenge to rank up is to recover from five different infections. And it says at your current rank of one that there is a slightly increased chance to recover from infections naturally, which would be some of the status effects I highlighted on the UI earlier. There's leadership under the social section, where to rank this one up, you have to sprint a thousand meters with an active follower, but that companions gain 15% affinity faster. So you can get to that romance just a little bit quicker. Right before that though, I caught them mid scroll and we got things like instigation where it says when combat is required, it can be advantageous to convince others to do the fighting for you. Upon unlock, it says you can force a target NPC at or below your level to attack their allies for a limited time. So think charm in your typical RPGs. There are ones that we unfortunately don't get full descriptions on because they scroll too fast, but we can still get a name and speculate under the social tree we have outpost management this is a good time to point out that there are different outpost related skills under different trees so this isn't just the only place you're going to find an outpost upgrade meanwhile under combat there is marksmanship where you see a bow and arrow which i thought was interesting because it may highlight a particular weapon type because here there are shotguns there's assault rifles pistols that all have their own combat skill trees lasers as well and then over here with marksmanship it makes you wonder a little bit but i don't believe there are bow and arrows in starfield although i would love to be surprised on that they do give us a description on rapid reloading it says in the chaos of combat the seconds needed to reload your weapon could be the difference of life or death where it says that this is now currently locked so we can't see unfortunately what it does but the name does suggest that this is going to be speeding up your reload times there's also targeting which sounds like an accuracy related type of stat which i think would make sense given some of the weapon descriptions showed off accuracy so perhaps this combined with a different weapon makes you nice laser focused accuracy Afterwards, we get a look at astrophysics, where to progress in the challenge, you have to scan 10 unique planets or moons. And it says that at its current rank, you can scan the moons of your current planet. You have a 10% chance of discovering a trait when scanning, which we'll get into. We do get a clear look at chemistry, which is exactly what you'd expect, kind of similar to Fallout. Your challenge is to create more chems. And it says you can create improved chems and research additional chems at a research lab. So you have tiers to which you can and research certain things you find in the world. But like I mentioned earlier, it's not just social that you find outpost related skills. You'll see here under the science tree, there is outpost engineering, which may have to do with certain buildings that you'll create versus others that are not affected by it. Then when we get into tech, this is where some of the spaceship skills play a factor. We have missile weapon systems and then particle beam weapon systems where it's defined as Ship weapons utilizing particle beam technology are the preferred choice for captains who prefer to damage multiple ships at once. Then the developers all highlight some of their favorites. There's Xeno Sociology, which is showcased right afterwards where you're able to actually mind control various creatures on planets. But you can also see here, you can frenzy them, you can make them flee, you can pacify them to make them work with you. So this is one of many ways you can approach these creatures, which is something we did see in Fallout 4. There's boost pack training, which we already know what that does. It allows you to fly around, get a double jump going on pretty much. There's neuro strikes, which we get to see, and we get a look at a physical physical skill, which we didn't get many looks at here. And we see that the martial arts skill is upgraded by doing damage with unarmed attacks. And that there is one for speech in negotiation where you can say, in this case, give someone some credits to allow you through the doorway. And tucked away here on the left side of the screen after a grenade was thrown, we know under the combat skill tree, there is now demolitions. So yeah, a absolute metric ton of skills, and that doesn't even get into all the ranks we'll inevitably see. And to all you non-believers out there, Pluto is a planet in Starfield. See, I told you all that bottom left corner would come in handy, and here we see that you can explore Pluto in Starfield, which I thought was just a really cool touch. While this screen is very blatantly in front of us, and it's not necessarily, ooh, I found a surprise detail, I think explaining the functionality of it is really important because it's going to be super useful down the line and worth familiarizing ourselves with. So you'll see here, it's a list of names, Barrett being one of the main companions you get in the game. You'll see all their skills are listed on the right side, the same exact skill set that we just dug into. And you'll notice that where they're assigned is listed and if they have an assignment at all. So Marika Boros is assigned on the frontier and it says exactly where the frontier is located. Meanwhile, someone like the security mini bot is actually assigned to an outpost 
and Jemison Alpha Centauri. Uh, and so this is really important because it's going to allow us to manage all these outposts. And I have this feeling, given that Fallout 4 had all the settlements that you could manage, that maybe what's going to happen is they can interact in this unique way. Like you can create the trade routes that you saw in Fallout 4. I think that would just be awesome. But again, I just wanted to point out this screen because they flip by it pretty quickly, but you can assign people from this menu. And I think that's going to be really good to manage your overall crew. One of my favorite parts of the entire direct is right here where they highlight the targeting control systems skill. The reason this is so exciting is because they show that you can target specific parts of your enemy ship. And I wanted to focus in on that because what it reminds me of is VATS, except you're in a spaceship, which I just can't get my mind around. I'm like, that is exactly what I didn't know I needed, but I am so in love with it. And you can see all the various parts you can target here. So this is just really cool attention to detail by Bethesda. Nearing the end of the direct, we get our most important piece of loot in a legendary item called the Incendiary Calibrated Deep Mining Space Helmet. It's a mouthful, but it's got three different passive effects. First to technician, minus 15% damage from robot enemies and the hacker, plus two max auto attempts that can be banked while hacking. And Incendiary, 10% chance to ignite nearby attackers. That last one, sounding pretty special. So I really like what we're doing here because it would probably go well with a melee build or something like that. I showed Pluto earlier, so naturally as I'm combing through this all, I gotta show Mercury. A lot of people are wondering, what do our planets look like, if you will? And we're getting some sneak peeks. We saw Pluto, now we're seeing Mercury. It looks like we're in some type of cave system. It doesn't look fully abandoned. So this will actually be another interesting one to go ahead and explore. Now Bethesda's getting into the thick of things with weapon customization, which if you played Fallout 4, you should be at least somewhat familiar with that. So there are six mod slots. We only see five here, which are the receiver, internal, optics, magazine and battery, and muzzle. Meanwhile, they actually get into the thick of the magazine and battery, and we see different size magazines magazines but we also see types of rounds we see white hot rounds we see explosive rounds so there's going to be multiple damage types per the types of weapons that you find out there which is far more customization already than what we saw in fallout 4. Now, I know if you've played a Bethesda Game Studios game before, this will not be much of a surprise, but since Starfield is a new IP, I felt it's at least worth pointing out that when you are crouched and hidden, you actually deal damage to someone who is unaware of your presence, you'll get bonus critical damage, as you'll see in the top right, sneak attack for 2.1 times damage. So this is something that I think is worth pointing out because we've seen this in Elder Scrolls, we've seen this in Fallout, and it is here in Starfield if you were going to do a stealth playthrough. Now this was a really fun detail that I'm glad I caught in my last skim of the direct. You'll notice as this character is getting ready to take a shot with their sniper scope that on the bottom left corner some of that O2 meter is starting to empty a little bit. That's because you'll see in the bottom middle, you can hold your breath and it does affect that meter down there. So it's actually something worth paying attention to if you're gonna do a stealth sniper kind of build. Tucked away in the very back of the final scissor reel of this direct is this right here. Maddie, what is Enhance? Well, what's interesting about this is if you go to the very beginning parts of the direct, we actually see in the character creator that you can go to various genetics facilities to change your appearance, which I think is awesome because it fits the sci-fi vibe of Starfield. So with that in mind, I saw this little promotion here in New Atlantis, where it is in fact pointing out that this is a place you can change your appearance. And then here it is on what looks to be neon. So I thought it was a really interesting connection here for those who are wondering what that place may look like that you can change your appearance. It seems this is it. There's a couple of little details I missed that I also wanted to tap into here at the end. Number one, you can have multiple ailments, it seems, from a cough to soreness, which I just thought was absolutely interesting here. I, maybe that ties into the infections we previously talked about, but nonetheless, it's kind of some of those survival sensibilities that we saw in Fallout 4. And then on top of that, when you scan certain locations, uh, this is where we see you can unlock an unknown geophysics trait. So we're still yet to really solve what these traits are but it looks like they're tied to analyzing parts of the planet and i don't know if these mean they're traits that you can attach to your outpost they did mention something like that if it's traits that you can attach to weapons armor and so on but nonetheless these are just two lingering details i wanted to clean up before we wrapped up here 
All right, ladies and gentlemen, that's it for the in-depth analysis. Thank you so much for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed. I hope you learned something about Starfield. And if you have something that maybe I missed, because that's always possible, please fire away down below. Let me know what you saw in this developer direct that you wanted to highlight or something that stood out to you. And let's let this become kind of the hub for all that information. With that, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for tuning in. Take excellent care of yourselves, and I will see you in the next video. Be sure to follow me on Twitter, follow me on Instagram. Those links are in the description down below. And a big thank you to all all the patrons, all the members who continue to support the hell out of the content here. Stay sexy, stay active. I love you all. Peace.